check. Hey guys, how are we doing? Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Dylan McClare. I'll be moderating this panel. panel. I'm, I'm here with Greg Foss, Foss, Jeff Booth, Nico, and I'm, I'm going to mispronounce the last name, so I'm not going to say it, <laughs> and uh, Prince Philip of Serbia. Uh, we're going to be talking about today, has Bitcoin failed as an inflation hedge? Uh, and we're really going to get in the weeds about what is inflation, what is Bitcoin, uh, the mess of the monetary system today, and, and you know how Bitcoin could be a fix to that. So first, I'm just going to go through uh, our guests here and, and let them give them a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, so turn it over to Greg. Well, hi, guys. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Amsterdam. What a beautiful city. Um, my name is Greg Foss. I am a 30-plus year trader in the financial markets. I focused on uh, trading junk bonds and credit risk. I personally believe Bitcoin to be the most important financial and technological innovation to solve the problems that we currently have in the credit markets globally. So I hope to bring some of that uh, enthusiasm as well as uh, experience to the table today. Thanks for having me here, Bitcoin Magazine. It's a pleasure. Uh, Jeff Booth, uh, I, I wrote a book called The Price of Tomorrow, um, an on, entrepreneur and Bix, Bitcoin maxi, um, and again, just like Greg, um, I, I see this as the only solve for the long-term transition of where we're going. Um, but thanks, for, thanks again, thanks a lot for having me here, really looking forward to the event. Good morning, my name is Nico Hilch. Uh, I'm a German speaker originally. I'm from Vienna, Austria. I'm a financial journalist. I've been covering the monetary system for about 15 years. Started with gold. Now I'm on the Bitcoin train. Most, most, of, my, most of the time I run a, a German podcast. It's called Was Bitcoin Bringt, also a YouTube channel. I do, also do a, an English um, newsletter because writing in English is easier, actually, because you don't have the inhibitions that you have uh, in, your, like in your native language, so you can swear more. Um, and um, it's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. We're going to have a great time. Hi, everyone. Well, my name is Prince Philip of Serbia, not suburbia. <laughs> um, I have about 15 years experience in, in finance, uh, specifically in asset management. But very recently, I gave up that job, that fiat world job, to, uh, to go full time in Bitcoin. And I work for Jan3 now with Samson Mao, uh, working towards nation state adoption. Um, I'm a Bitcoin maximist, and I'm here because Bitcoin is going to fix the world. So to, so to kick off the convo, uh, I think I'm going to turn it over to, to Jeff Booth to, I guess, lay the groundwork for what is inflation, uh, what is, you know, how does the monetary system work at the core, and to really strip it all back to, to a first principles level. I, I don't think there's many people in the world uh, that can articulate it as well as Jeff, so, uh, you know. Just that. Give it away. Just that. Well, well even the... Uh, even the uh, title of this uh, panel, it, it, it presupposes we're going to measure a system through the system, um, and, and that becomes a big problem. So, so if you just strip back, strip back everything to first principles, the free market with technology is a deflationary force. What, what should happen is prices should fall as we invent new ways of doing things better. We, we save that time, and that in a free market, that would transition with the broadest, the broadest abundance to humanity. That's what would be natural. So anything that stops that is man-made. So when we, talk about, when we talk about inflation, it is only man-made because we grant people an ability to drive up an inflation rate against that force. Now, you could argue we have to, and we could have that argument, and, and a credit-based system does have to, otherwise the whole thing fails, and it fails spectacularly. And what ends up happening is a credit-based system, what we think it has to, most people believe that for a productive economy to work, you have to have 2% inflation. And I would ask you to question that belief, because why, why, do, why do you have to have 2% theft in your money 
for a productive economy for the for us to trade with each other. It doesn't make sense. But while that belief stands, we will we will vote for people who say, "Yep, two percent inflation sounds fair," and then that two percent inflation has to be turned into three percent inflation, five percent inflation, eight percent inflation. 15% inflation, because the debt has to be paid back in cheaper. It, 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 and, and the only way to pay back the debt is either collapse the debt, a deflationary spiral, which would look like the 30s, and everything, every other single thing we live in is from that system. So nobody's going to vote to collapse the system. And the other way to pay it back is to have high inflation for a long time. Which causes other problems for society. So that's just where we are in in society, and there is no fix from the system. There's, Sorry. yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I think maybe just to, to, to define: is inflation is it a measure of of consumer prices rising, or is it a, a measure of of monetary supply? And I guess also, how is money supply created or introduced in this current system? Yeah. And, and how, you know, how do we get there? I think that's probably an important point to cover. So it's it's introduced through credit. We live in a credit-based system, and we and that credit just has to expand. So it's it's introduced through loans and, and credit in the system, and it just has to keep going. So when you tighten that, where we are in the cycle right now, as uh, as the Fed is tightening, that's going to create a tightening and effectively a death spiral, in a in a credit collapse. And, and other countries facing repaying that debt in, in U.S. T- terms are going to face their own death spiral first, and they're likely going to print into that. But again, if you just come back to that system that we live in, that you measure your house prices by, that you elect your officials in, that every single thing you do reinforces that system. And Bitcoin is an alternative system. And what's what's actually happening? If you just if you ask, is Bitcoin an inv- inflation hedge here? It's an inflation hedge and a deflation hedge. What it is doing is repricing that entire system over time, and it can reprice it through through a credit collapse, or it can reprice it through inflation. That's but that's what's happening, and it's slowly repricing the entire system, and transitioning us to a new system. That works with hope, uh, hope and abundance, hope, truth and abundance on a new system, instead of the system we live in that has to work through coercion, fear, and control. Hop in here, Greg. So, we always want to take a few gems away from uh, from Jeff. The reality that we're based on a credit-based system, perhaps, is. Uh, in my opinion, easily is most easily explained from a global perspective. And total debt in the world today, according to the Institute of International Finance, is over 400 trillion U.S. dollars equivalent. So that includes all government debt. It includes all corporate debt, all bank debt, all mortgages. 400 trillion U.S. dollars. Without unfunded liabilities. I'm sorry? Without unfunded liabilities. Okay, without unfunded liabilities. But stick with me here. This is the amount of debt outstanding in the world. And round numbers, the global economy is only 100 trillion U.S. dollars. Okay? So you're... your numerator is four times the size of your denominator. If you assume an average coupon in your numerator is 3%, do we think that the global economy can grow at 4 times 3%, which is 12%? Do you think global economy can grow at 12% in order to keep pace with the growth in debt, the organic growth in the debt due to the coupon? And I think the rational answer is no. So that in itself is the inflation component of the global debt GDP spiral. It's only grade 11 math, people. 
Don't overthink this. We are in a spot right now where we have inflation because of credit inflation. So Bitcoin is actually your insurance on that credit inflation. Bitcoin might not be correlated to CPI, your consumer price index inflation, but I am 100% certain it is your best insurance against your credit inflation. And that is pure mathematics because we have reached a point in global debt where it is growing organically faster than your economy or your tax base can possibly keep up. Don't overthink it. We have reached the point of no return. You need your appropriate insurance. So Bitcoin, 13 years old, thank God for Bitcoin, okay? It is our insurance policy against this debt spiral that, by the way, that spiral doesn't even include the new spending to protect you from the inflation they, they, they brought on in the first place. So thank goodness they're spending more money to protect you from the inflation in the UK that they brought on in the first place. This is a clown show. Protect yourself from the clown show. Thanks. I want to I turn it over to our two, our two European natives uh, and just kind of talk about, we, you know, we talk about the consumer price index versus, I guess, monetary debasement or, or money supply growth. Um, Europe, obviously, is in the, in the middle of, of somewhat of an energy crisis, an energy deficit, um, which has led to skyrocketing prices, 10% year-over-year inflation, 15% in some places. How is it from the ground here, uh, and how, how are people thinking about Euro, the inflation, uh, you know, the response to that. Give us, give us some, uh, some outlook. So I think it's important to understand that inflation is the, the Germans' biggest fear because of the hyperinflation of the 1920s. Um, by the way, has anybody ever heard of a, of a period of hyperdeflation? Because I haven't. Um, the word doesn't even really exist. But that's only a side note. I think it's important, to, and, and now what we're seeing in Europe right now is complete madness. It is complete madness. And the thing is that we have entered uh, a time of helicopter money already. So we are getting money wired directly to the bank accounts. Every single measure that is um, done against the inflation we're seeing right now is measured in money. It's 100 billion there, 100 billion there. Um, we are going to enter a phase, this is my, my opinion, um, where politicians will just tell you how much money you get when you vote for them. And they're going to print it on, on the, the posters, on the election posters. Like, vote for me, you get 10,000. No, vote for me, you get 20,000. This is not going to end well. Absolutely not, because you cannot print energy. We, we print it as out of the financial crisis. We print it because of the, of the, the euro crisis. And we print it in the pandemic. But you cannot print the energy now. This is real stuff now. How did we end up here and how can Bitcoin help? I think it's important to, to see the history real quick. 413 years ago, the Bank of Amsterdam was, was founded here in Amsterdam. Um, it was the precursor to what we call a modern central bank. They, 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 because Amsterdam was a market city, all the, 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 the people came here to, to exchange goods and they brought all the different kinds of, of, of currencies, you know. And the, the city said, that's a good idea, we'll take all the currencies, we'll give you our currency so you can, we can facilitate trade. About a hundred years later, um, they found that the Swedish uh, Riksbank, which was really the first central bank, it was, it was founded because of a bailout of a private bank. And, 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 the, and they, they switched to state ownership, and that's where the real drama began. But it, began, it, it worked well for a long time because centralization was necessary to make the world run, right? It was necessary. Bitcoin really is, in my opinion, a breakthrough because for the first time in history, really, we do not need decentralization. And I think that the, the inflation of the system... Um, is a, is, a, is, a, is a necessary evil of centralization. You will always end up with inflation because the, 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 the austerity, deflation, and the other, the other way of, of, of you know, staying out of trouble will never be voted for. It will never work in a, in a democratic system. And it was tried a bit with Greece, and it didn't work. Um, they are not going to go for that. So yes, 
Uh, somebody once said hyperinflation is the, is, is the act of saving debt at all costs, and that's what's going to happen. We're going to print every single uh, dollar or euro that's going to be needed, and then we're going to deal with the problems afterwards. Philip, you want to hop in? Yeah. So in Serbia, where I live right now, um, recent print of inflation was about 13.8%. 13, 13 Serbia, I should say Yugoslavia in the 90s, experienced the third highest ever hyperinflation in, in the world. I mean, they were devastated. And now we're in double digits again. And they're saying that next year, don't worry, guys, it's going to go back down to about 5%, 4%. Yeah, <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> um, and this is what Bitcoin really is going to help um, people in Serbia, but not only just that, but people all around the world. And it's, I think it's very key that we educate people, understand the scarcity of Bitcoin and how it actually solves the inflation, the inflation issue that we're all going to experience right now. Um, I think, well, Jeff touched on this, like it's the, the, um, the panel that we're talking about, this panel that we're on right now, it's, 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 it's about the narrative of, of the fiat world. When we then live in a Bitcoin world, the inflation is not really an issue. It's, it's right now at 2% and after the next halving, it's going to go down. If, um, I mean, please, I, I don't know what the number is going to be, but if you go, go to El Salvador right now, they actually give two digits, two, two um, um, numbers for inflation. They give their fiat inflation in US dollars and they give their Bitcoin inflation, which is about 2%. And that's, that's fantastic. So I think education and telling people that we finally have an asset, we finally have something to store your energy, your time, your, your, um, your hard work in, 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 in an asset that's not going to be inflated away. It's beautiful. And if you just DCA every week, every whenever it is, however much you can afford, and you live in your Bitcoin standard, Personally, the closer, you, the faster you move to that, the the better. You know, you, the, the 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 more um, the more you'll be saved in the future, I guess. So, yeah, this is. I'll finish on that. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I I like to uh, I like to call Bitcoin like it's a, it's an engineering solution to this this problem that we see today uh, with with our monetary system and and kind of going back a little further. We're talking about you know, central banks, the centralization of money. If we go back to when the world was on a, on a gold standard, and, and it's important to understand that no, there wasn't one president or dictator or person that said, we're going to use gold. Humanity converged upon gold because of its monetary properties. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, we got the centralization of gold, and we got uh, kind of you know, banking systems co-opting gold because gold couldn't scale for a global economy. So what did you have? You had banks that would store your gold, but ultimately, because of greed and human incentive, they would lend out multiple certificates of deposit or multiple claims on that gold. Uh, obviously, there, uh, that resulted in bank runs and, and collapses, and fractional reserve banking with an actual you know, sound money at the base of it doesn't work. So now we're in a system where we have fractional reserve banking, but really, the only thing at the, at the base level of the system is the collateral itself, which is just debt. So you have, you have promises on top of promises, or you know, just kind of a system of IOUs, where you deposit $100 at the bank, they take 90 of it and lend it out. Banks lending money creates money in the system. And so ultimately, what we're seeing now, right? Bitcoin's down 70%, and you have the detractors that are saying it, it has failed once again. But Bitcoin's risen uh, you know, in a parabolic fashion and crashed, crashed 80% three or four times, right? But what are we seeing in the legacy system? We're seeing the stock market, global equities down 30%. We're seeing bonds down 30%, and, right? And like Bitcoin is a $400 billion asset. The global bond market, the global stock market combined is... 500 trillion. Yeah, hundreds of trillions of dollars. So, you know, the bond market sneezes and coughs up more than than Bitcoin's market cap multiple times over in a day, right? So I think it's just important to contextualize when we're saying, hey, you know, Bitcoin is supposed to be the solution to inflation. What, what is happening? The reality is we're seeing consumer price inflation, but we're seeing broad-based asset deflation at the moment. We're seeing this huge everything bubble that was a result of zero interest rate policy, uh, basically the cost of capital being negative, 
right? If you, if you talk to any, anyone that's in finance, right, it's just basic math. How do you value an asset? Well, you have a discount rate, you have an interest rate, and you can calculate the valuation of assets based on your, your interest rate. Well, when the interest rate is zero and you have inflation at 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, your cost of capital is negative. So with a negative cost of capital, input that into your, your finance equation and, and tell me what you get for an asset valuation. And the answer is it doesn't compute, right? So we have this global everything bubble because the cost of capital is not even free, it's negative. Debt, de- it's a historic debt binge. And now we're seeing you know, inflation at 40 to 50 year highs around the world and it's all unwinding, right? So, so I propose to anyone you know, in, the, in, the, in the audience, but really around the world, and the reason we're here today talking about this is find me a solution to this problem because we have debt to GDP at 400%. We have U.S. federal you know, public debt to GDP over 100%. Find me a solution to this problem that doesn't just end up with, you know, end up in tears as a result of you know, perpetual money printing. Um, and so I think that's, just, that's the base of my, my argument is, okay, we have an, we have an engineering solution here. You know, we, 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 did, we did rocks. We did, we did gold. We did monetary metals. We did government IOUs. We did promises. Uh, and, and it's not working. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe this thing is a technical solution to this $500 trillion problem. And, and that you can approach that as, you know, an investable asset, as a, as a kind of, as a theory or thesis on, on how to grow your money. Or you can approach it as, hey, this is like, in terms of human rights, this might be the biggest, you know, the biggest idea of our time. I, th- I think it's important to understand, too, that uh, the central bankers they know it's going to fail at some point. They absolutely know. That's why it took them 400 years to demonetize gold. 400 years. But they still kept the stuff. They still kept the stuff. And there was like, um, they, they actually took it down, but the, it was the Dutch Central Bank who had a whole section on their, on their website talking about, yeah, you know, if we have a total catastrophic collapse of the monetary system, if that should ever happen, we still have the gold, right? They know they have to keep something that people will trust in um, in times of crisis, and that historically was always gold. So can, we can sit here and talk about could they adopt Bitcoin in any way. If they, if they would do that, they would have to buy the stuff first, and that would be you know, spectacular. Um, so I don't know ab- about that, but they know they're going to fail. Germany and Austria, and I think even the Dutch, they got their gold home, right, in 2015. They got it from, home from the U.S., they got it home from the U.K., because they know they're going to need it at some point. Yeah, I, I just say building on that. Just remember every single person you're talking to that isn't at this Bitcoin conference, that doesn't know what we're talking about, might not be as deep in this, is spending most of their time reinforcing a system that is four orders of magnitude bigger than Bitcoin today. And so they're measuring that system through the system. And when we talk about inflation, when we talk about your house price, when we talk about who you're going to vote for on the left or right, you are all just, everybody is reinforcing that system. And if the system doesn't give more money, the system that everybody is in collapses and every bank collapses at some point. So you can guarantee at some point it's going to give a lot more money. And then you have to ask, if humans could have solved global coordination, created abundance by by printing more units of paper, if it was that easy... Wouldn't we have solved this problem 5,000 years ago? Right? And, and, and it, it leaves you, there is no solve for this problem. There is no, so you could go back to a gold reserve and start it all over. You could go to war. Typically, what, what ends up happening in this end of, of a great debt, debt cycle, and what ends up happening is the debt gets, the debt never gets paid back. The debt moves up higher in, on the stack. And now the debt is at a government level and, and a sovereign debt uh, level, and it's too big to get paid back. In, in, in the U.S. In, in 1980, it was, it was not at the government level. So they could impose interest rates um, and then take it up to the government level uh, over time. And that's what happened. So it didn't actually get smaller. It just moved from corporate up to the gov- uh, government level. And now we're at, a, at the end of that cycle and it can't move. It, so it has to be paid back through, it has to get a lot cheaper in real terms through hyperinflation 
or it has to fail spectacularly. Um, there are only two choices from this, from this system. And what you have, and you have everybody measuring that system from the system and voting for more of it. Because who is going to vote for a system? Who, it, 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 show of hands, who's going to say to the, to vote for the politician who says, hey, I'm going to collapse everything tomorrow, all the banks collapse, food, uh, food prices, everything <laughs> stops tomorrow. I don't think you would vote for that. I don't think you would vote for that because as much as you say that's the right thing to do, society, what, what would happen into that void? It would be horrific. You would not be able to walk down the street. You'd, the, like, society would collapse and into that void dictators would, would, would race in. If you were Christine Lagarde, would you print more money or print more and more money? Yeah, and, 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 that, and that's it. And so, so you can expect that because you will vote for that and your neighbors will vote for that and they'll blame others, you can expect the division of us to continue out of this system. And, what you, and the best thing you could do is tell your friends, tell your loved ones, tell, tell people as fast as you can to start opting with their time into the new system because you're going to build a bridge for them so more people can walk over that bridge to transition from one system to another. Up so, here, yeah. What... It's always easy to be on stage with Jeff Booth, you know. You just, <laughs> uh, you just sit and learn. But uh, I wanted to build on the point of, uh, you know, how debt keeps getting pushed higher. So I started my trading career in 1988. And two very important things about that. Firstly, in 1988, we had CPI inflation in the United States of about 8%. And isn't it interesting that the Fed funds rate, or the overnight rate, as set by the chairman, Paul Volcker, at that time, was double digits. It was over 12% to fight 8% inflation, CPI. Well, today, we have 8% CPI inflation in the US and Fed funds rate is 3.25 okay they cannot possibly get back to a level that will properly fight CPI inflation which has got to be at least 5% higher than it is today without exploding the world because we can't even handle a 3.25% U.S. Fed funds rate, and you're already seeing the cracks form in the system. Why? Because back in 1988, when I first started, we had our first major financial crisis. It was called the Latin American debt crisis. Okay? Foreign countries, predominantly in South America, had borrowed money in U.S. dollars to finance their budgets. And when the U.S. dollar got strengthened, they found it untenable to be able to pay back the debt in U.S. dollar terms. So they defaulted. That was the first financial crisis that kicked responsibility one level higher. The second one was long-term capital management. Ten years later, 1999. A genius on Wall Street who had a Nobel Prize, actually there were two Nobel Prize winners, they levered themselves 100 times and sold insurance to Wall Street. Well, guess what? The insurance company went bankrupt, which meant Wall Street would have gone bankrupt if the Fed didn't come in and rescue Wall Street. That's the second one. The third one, 2008. The great financial crisis. I was working at a hedge fund. I can promise you the world was over. Okay? I have never been so scared in my entire life as in 2008, 2009. With the caveat, with the exception of today. I'm just as scared today as I was sitting in a risk chair in 2006, 7, and 9. Okay? Scared of, scared of what? Just... just to clarify, scared of... Scared of the system. implosion of the financial yeah. system. Now, the Fed did what they needed to do, once again, brought it to that level. The final 
crisis was the response to the COVID crisis in 2020. And that solidified the debt spiral as I see it. So I want you guys to take one thing away from here. I was lucky enough to find Bitcoin in 2016 as a solution to the Fiat Ponzi as I see it. The Fiat Ponzi of sitting in a risk chair, working in a credit-based world. Fiat is the Ponzi, Bitcoin is the solution. Now I did find it when Bitcoin was trading under $1,000 per Bitcoin, US. My point to you today is Bitcoin, very simply, is a far better risk-adjusted investment today than it was when I found it in 2016. Why? The response to the COVID crisis, that is written in the history books, and now the response to the clown show that we are living where they are printing more money to solve the problems that they created by kicking the can up the capital stack to the level of sovereign debt. There's nowhere else we can kick this to, people. The countries have no choice. So, if you love somebody, tell them to buy Bitcoin. Okay? It's that simple. When I tell you to buy Bitcoin, it's because I love you. Okay? I have three kids. I don't, I've, I've done okay in my life. But I own Bitcoin for the kids, okay? As simple as that. And you don't have to own 100% of your portfolio in Bitcoin. But please don't own 0% of your portfolio in Bitcoin. Own up to 5% to start, study it, and focus on the other 95% of your portfolio that is sewering Bitcoin now has lower volatility than the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The 30 largest companies in the world have higher volatility than Bitcoin. Focus on the donut, not on the whole, okay? I have never been so excited about a technology for my children. Young kids like Dylan are our future. I'm a 60 year old, old white, excuse the language, I'm an old white fuck that has screwed this world up. Let's make amends for the kids, okay? It's that simple. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, oh, I just wanted to make a, make a point actually that um, recently, Seeing the, how strong the dollar is, the DXY, the dollar, the dollar, dollar index, is what, it's like 112, it almost went to 114 the other day. Yeah, 113. Yeah, 130, yeah, that's it. So it's, it's strong, it's strong. A year or two ago, when Bitcoin was at, at its peak, uh, whenever, whenever the dollar strengthened, whenever there was a talk about that, Bitcoin always dropped. Not anymore, actually. In the last few months, Bitcoin has actually held strong against the, the, the dollars. So that is, a, to me, is a, it could be a good sign, maybe for the decoupling. I don't know. Is, is that going to happen or not? But, so, sorry, remember, remember, and back to you, fiat is all relative. Everything trades against the U.S. dollar. But the U.S. dollar is just the best-looking horse at the glue factory, right? Like, who cares? They're all melting ice cubes. It's just that the relative rate of decay of other fiat money is faster than the DXY or the, U yeah. sorry, the U.S. dollar. So, therefore, DXY strengthens. Exactly. But they're all melting ice cubes. And the reference rate of the world currency, when the reference rate of every other currency, every other nation, is the U.S. dollar and it can't pay back its debt, and it has to drive inflation at a, at a high rate to pay back its debt or go into a death spiral, then what would happen everywhere else? And I think that's a, when I talk about four orders of magnitude, if the U.S. tightens for a while, because it's four orders of magnitude and everybody's chasing to safety, they're tr chasing to the U.S. dollar as a result, and all of the, all of the, all of the debt is 
paid back in U.S. dollars all over the world. So if people are racing the U.S. dollar, making it, uh, making it stronger, all of these things are going to move back and forth lots of times in the next little while. And it's going to feel, I'd say, in this world, expect the unexpected, because the unexpected is going to happen more and more. All the, it's just going to feel like, what, where did that come from? That's, what's, that's the, the world we live in. At the same time is Bitcoin, you can't change it. It's, 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 so when, you, when we talk about pricing Bitcoin in U.S. dollars or pricing them in Turkish lira or pricing them in your native currency, that is the error code. It, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin, and it's going to reprice this entire stack, everything over time. So sit, sit back, and, and once you really understand that, once you understand what's, what, what's happening there, then after you've made that investment, protected your, your assets, start to look at what is being built on top of this network. Start to look at layer two and three solutions and all of the value. Because right now, what we're doing is we're talking about the plumbing of a system. We're talking about the plumbing of, this, of the credit-based system today in the world. We're talking about the plumbing of Bitcoin. And, and we don't experience value typically through the plumbing. We experience value on the products that are built on top of the plumbing. So, and, and the products that are being built are the services the goods, the, and the products that are going to be built on top of the new plumbing to bring on billions of people is going to be staggering. Uh, and I've said this a, a number of times. If you, were, if you were sitting as an executive at, at Sears from 1995 to 2010, you would have a frame of the world that things were getting really bad and it would get worse and worse and worse. And if you were an executive at, at Amazon, you would have a frame of the world, wow, this is getting better and better. The people that are in this audience, us, the people that are sitting in this frame, understanding what can be built here, see hope, abundance, and a better future. And if you're deep into that and you're seeing all of the companies that are building on top of this, you go, I, I just look at it myself, I, I cannot believe I get to be in this world, in this frame, building the future with all these incredible people. That's, that, but, I to, but I get most people aren't in that frame. Most people are in a different frame, and your frame controls your life. Nico, I saw you wanted to hop in. Uh, yeah, I just want to say that... Um, what Jeff was saying just earlier on in, in his beautiful speech just then was that actually the U.S. exports their inflation to the world. So, <laughs> I mean, that's crazy to think that everyone wants the U.S. dollar because the world, it's, their, it's essentially the world reserve currency. And I think it's, it's for us to now to educate the world that we have to move away from that and the world reserve currency should be, should be Bitcoin. And we should all be moving our, our, our savings into Bitcoin and, in, and, and living in, in our personal Bitcoin standards. Yeah, just wanted to say that. Can I just say something? Because with the, I also have kids, small kids. And I know a bit about like, the plans and the necessities that you know, central bankers and economists see for the future. I do not want my kids to live in a world that is a dystopian horror show of central bank digital currencies. This idea is absolutely insane because it opens the door to manipulation, censorship. It opens the door to, you know, Jeff can buy coffee from Monday to, through Wednesday and I can buy coffee Thursday, Friday, and that's how we cap coffee prices, right? And if you don't believe that the economists thinking about these things, think about these things specifically, <coughs> then I have news for you. I don't want to be like the... So what I see in the, in, the, in the Bitcoin world is a positive vision of the future. I see Bitcoin as a social network. We wouldn't be here without Bitcoin, right? Uh, there's so many people you meet and, uh, um, um, because of Bitcoin, and then you all have like the same basis. We have something to build up on. You have something to build with you. everybody. So many people in Bitcoin start, you know, companies and start building, building things because they have a positive vision of, of the future. Other people do not have a positive vision of the future anymore. It's just more crisis, more problems, and more, and more you know, devastation. So I would urge you all to, to go out and not only 
like see Bitcoin as a, as a hedge against inflation or as, as a way to protect you financially. It's a, it's a way to protect your future and the future even of your country and of your democracy and of your, your, uh, your family um, because there, the other way is there is no future there. It's, it's, it's really, really pretty bleak and, and we, we still have time, we still have the possibility to stop this because Bitcoin is already here and with the central bank digital currencies, they are now starting like the computers. So, because, and I, I really believe this, um, they are rushing it now. And when central banks rush something, it's always very dangerous, but also it's a chance because the Bitcoin came and Bitcoin was not expected by anybody. Education is key. Yes. It, yeah, I think there's one of the big things that I, I see people get really stumped upon is, you know, Bitcoin is like supposedly the, just this intangible thing. It's this digital currency and, and people call it sound money, hard money. How, how, is it, how is it tied in any way to reality? And, and this is one of the things that's, that's pretty hard to explain in 30 seconds. But I think the, the aha moment for myself personally, and I think a lot of people uh, in particular, especially in the midst of this, this you know, energy crisis, we're seeing Bitcoin has a, a, a tie to real world energy expenditure. It has a tie to the, to the tangible world. Uh, proof of work, proof of work mining. And this is the thing, you know, Bitcoin Magazine where I work, BTC Inc., the, the Bitcoin conference. The reason that we focus on Bitcoin and not broadly blockchain, crypto, etc., is because the thing that separates Bitcoin from everything else is one is, is you know, the fair launch, the decentralization, all of that. But the reality is proof of work and, and the you know, hash rate at all-time highs, right? Bitcoin's 70% down, hash rate's at all-time highs. So what does that mean? It means that the amount of com computational power and energy expenditure globally dedicated, purpose-dedicated to just mining Bitcoin is at all-time highs. So if you think of Bitcoin as like a tangible, as a, as a commodity, it's this digital synthetic commodity, well, you have with proof of work mining and with the difficulty adjustment, which the difficulty adjustment, if, if hash rate if the total computational power kind of chasing this asset, mining this asset goes up by 10%, mining difficulty goes up 10% with it. If it goes up, if it doubles, mining difficulty doubles. It makes it that much harder to, to mine. So, so what you have here is you have an absolutely scarce asset. Yes, it's intangible, but you have this immutable ledger that no one can change or, or, or mess with, with this absolutely scarce asset that in the real world, tied to the real world, is getting harder and harder and harder to incrementally produce, right? So in a world of central bank digital currencies, even today, without, you know, explicit CBDCs, money's mostly digital, you know, Venmo, Cash App, et cetera, your bank account. It's all just ledgers. It's all a ledger, right? And so now we have not only a ledger, but we have a ledger that's tangibly tied to the real world. And I think that's like one of the the biggest aha moments here is we have a fair system that no one can cheat and it's a completely digital in a digital native sense but there's a physical tie to reality there's a physical tie to nature that no one can cheat and that's like the aha moment that's that's satoshi's innovation is is tying digital money to the real world Said it, you said it as well before in a different way. You also, on layer two, you, get, you start to get velocity through technology instead of velocity through debt. And that is a huge deal because we've always had to construct to work in a global, global trust because all money is is really the trust interlinking us. It's information describing that, that, that trust. And we've had to, to coordinate society We've centralized function through, through gold, and then we've used credit to drive velocity and money. So we could spread around, because gold couldn't move around at a rate that was fast enough for our economies. Um, what Bitcoin does by, on the second layer, so you have an immutable asset on the first. What Bitcoin does on the second layer and, thir and, and third is you have unlimited velocity and money. And, and that piece, that many people don't see yet, means the description of what we typically do in trying to describe how the new world's going to work, we carry baggage from the old world. We've never had something like Bitcoin before. So even, even when you think about how did we protect ourselves, so we protected ourselves, free markets, 
produce higher living standards than non-free markets, kind of evidence throughout history. And so we protect free markets with institutions, but we never had decentralization and security together. So we protected free markets with rule of law. Magna Carta, um, Constitu Bill of Rights, Constitution, rule of law to protect ourselves from institutions getting too big. But what you find is money is superordinate to rule of law. If it didn't look like that, then places with the most broken money would have the best laws. And so money is more important than rule of law, and it always, and because the people with money either, either win in court or rewrite the laws. So what you see throughout society is we could never have, because we had to have decentralized, we never had decentralization and trust together, we had to have these institutions protecting us, and then the institutions themselves get corrupted over time. That's where we are today in the world, unfortunately. And, and, but what changes because of decentralization and trust on the base layer and on the se second and third layer, you don't have to recreate all of the mess that we had in this system to the new system. And that brain, because it works, it works almost completely opposite to the system we've grown and know, known. So it's easy to carry in your baggage. It's easy for anybody to carry their baggage into the new system. And I, I say often that the me measurement of a system is the system. You, you have to intuit what the new system will do because it works on different rules. And that's where we are, which is really exciting for where Bitcoin moves. Ex I think exciting doesn't even even I mean start with yeah. start with it right I mean what you're describing here is a breakthrough on the level that I think nobody even in this room can imagine where it can lead to um, and I want to take this opportunity to call yes Satoshi Nakamoto is going to get that damn Nobel Prize in economics that we're all <laughs> at some point and I and I know how he's going to get it I, I thought about this I know how he's going to get it so the economist who predicted um, Bitcoin was Friedrich August von Hayek, right? There's this, this famous video from 1984 where he said, all we need is some sly roundabout way to do something they can't stop. And he got the prize eventually. He was the first non-Keynesian economist because the Nobel Prize is not actually a Nobel Prize, a fake Nobel Prize, and it's paid for by the Sw Swedish Central Bank, right? It was introduced in 1968 uh, as a precursor to the fiat era, and they had to give it to Hayek because he was so popular and so brilliant. But what they did is they split the price and get the, gave the other half to some Swedish socialist that we all forgot about. I know his name. I'm not going to tell you. because, <laughs> And they're going to do the same thing with Satoshi Nakamoto eventually. And they're going to give the other half to who is going to be the father of central bank digital currencies, Vitalik Buterin. Brilliant. I'm calling it today. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't even, I think in terms of a Nobel Prize, it, it, would, it would seem like an honor, but then you have guys like Ben Bernanke and, and, and Paul Krugman winning, winning that. So I guess we got, we got three minutes left. We've talked a bunch about where the system is at today uh, and kind of the craziness that's unfolding. For the last three minutes, what can we expect in the next coming years? We have, we have bond markets selling off like crazy, the, the dollar is soaring again, you know, against all major global currencies to, to record highs. How does this play out? And, and will the, the narrative of Bitcoin as an inflation hedge or a debasement hedge, how does that shift? Take it away, Greg. I have no idea, but Bitcoin is the solution. All paths lead to Bitcoin. It's that simple, people. All paths lead to Bitcoin. If I may take a moment real quickly. The Bitcoin community is the most amazing community I've ever been involved with. It is a community of givers, a community of educators. Wall Street, where I spent my life, 99% takers, okay? Be part of the giving community, the Bitcoin community. Over to you guys. I, w I wanted to echo what uh, Greg said there. You know, I've been to, uh, I've been to some other conferences, financial conferences, and the egos in, the, in that room is just huge. You know, they're just spewing out the doors, you know, out the, out the ceiling. When you're in a Bitcoin conference meeting people like yourself, it's such humble people, it's such uh, people that are aware of the problems of this world. And that's really quite something beautiful. 
And another point I want to say is that uh, I think it's important that when you want to orange peel someone, it's, to always to, uh, and it's always to teach them about the history of money and let them learn about the history of money. This is something that's not taught in schools. They don't want you to learn this. So it's important that you teach them what the history of money is because that then leads to Bitcoin. It's, t it's basically talking about Bitcoin without talking about Bitcoin. So history of money. Love it. Nico, Jeff, you want to you wanna end on anything? We've got, we got a minute left. I, I, I would just say, if you want to uh, teach non-Bitcoiners about Bitcoin, it was ask them a question that moves around in their mind instead of telling them the answer, instead of yelling at them. Because people, when people are in fear, they move more to fear. They're not going to listen, and they're going to oppose you and you have to break through, through that a whole bunch of different ways. We, we let go of a lie one finger at a time, and, and inflation is, is required for a productive society is a lie. But pe people don't get, get that. They have to understand it, and they have to, so you have to ask them qu questions. The other thing I'd just say really quickly is, in this world that we're moving into, you can expect human nature to reign. And you could expect what people are going to do and drive into this through that fear and, and what they're going to ask for and what's going to happen. Think, think about the human nature. Think about what your friends or what you might do in a given scenario of all these scenarios, and you'll easily, more easily see what other people are going to do too. I think we'll end on that. Thanks, guys. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Magazine Analyst Dex, brought to you by BitGo. We are live at Bitcoin Amsterdam, and I'm joined to my left by Mills, as well as Joe Hall. We just heard an excellent talk from Joe, Jeff Booth, Greg Foss, uh, Prince Philip, Dylan LeClaire, and Nico as well. Joe, what was your big takeaway from that last panel? There are so many good quotes, man. I mean, uh Foss, Greg Foss coming out with uh, Protect Yourself from the Clown Show, um, then, you know, shilling the Bitcoin community. Ahead of that, you had Jeff Boo talking about how, you know, you want to orange pill your family and your friends, take them on this journey with you. Um, really enjoyable first talk. It makes me excited for the rest of the day, to be honest. Absolutely. Bill, when you hear things like clown wor world getting thrown around, what does that mean to you? It means there's a, a departure from truth and a departure from us critically thinking about everything that's happening and assessing it. We're just living in this reality, this simulation. Oh, you're, you're speaking Is it speak too early language, for this? <laughs> speak in my language when we talk simulation, <laughs> but I do have to say as well, it has been very interesting just to sort of see this, see these stories come to life, see these conversations happening and the way they're sort of handling the conversation around inflation and does it even matter? I loved how very quickly all, all three of the, all four of the panelists actually were very quick to just say, this, this narrative, it doesn't matter. Everything will eventually, all roads lead back to Bitcoin, to quote Greg Foss himself.